I can't even tell you what a profoundly important film Texas Chainsaw Massacre is to me. It's one of the great cinematic works. Uh, it demonstrates what cinema can do in a way few other films can. I've seen it and been thrilled by it many times. I've been told during the South by Southwest, this past South by Southwest, we uh, showed the 40th restored, the 40th anniversary restored print. And I was sitting in the back with Toby and actually got to ask him all the questions I've always wanted to ask him about every scene in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So I think we annoyed the whole audience. We'll try not to do that tonight. Um, so I was at dinner with him one night and Eggshells, his first film, was a famous lost film. And I turned to him at one point during the course of this very pleasant dinner and I said, you have a print of Eggshells, don't you? And he smiled. And a couple of years later, working with Mark Rance, my partner in England, uh, who uh, Mark Rance and I put out the whole shooting match, Eagle Pinnell film, that had been lost for a long time, and we found it in Germany. Uh, there was no print anywhere else, and then we put it out in a box set, and we, we, were, we, we wanted to do the same thing with eggshells, restore it and, and release it. And so um, we, went, we went to Toby, and, and we did that, and now, uh, because of the 40th anniversary of Texas Chainsaw, Toby is going through a renaissance. He was at um, Khan and they showed the restored, the 40th anniversary restored print of Texas Chainsaw Massacre at the Palais with a thousand people, and he got a 15 minute standing ovation at the end of the film, which he absolutely deserved. It's a thrill to look back at the film before Texas Chainsaw Massacre. What I really look forward to doing is curating the next series on Toby Hooper, the films after Chainsaw Massacre, Eaten Alive, which is just wonderful, and Fun House, and Poltergeist, and Salem's Lot, and then the mid-period films, especially Life Force, which is just an amazing movie. Yes. <laughs> and, um, and then all the later TV stuff. There's so much, there's, there's a treasure chest here, and it's not looking in the past, it's looking through the whole career. And so sometime in the future, we'll be doing a lot more Toby Hooper programs. But let me say, this is one, one a great filmmaker, a, a wonderful Austinite who has wonderful stories about growing up here, and a, a terrific human being, Toby Hooper. too long, too, too, too often, too long. And, and uh, this, is, this is 45 years old, and it's, uh, and it's a, a little look at what it was like 45 years ago in Austin. And, and, um, and well, what was called, uh, well, the hippie culture, subculture, counterculture. But we'll talk about it after you see it, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Love you guys. Uh, we'll open for questions in a second, but why, why don't you start by talking about your child? You grew up in Austin. Why don't you start talking about your childhood? And actually start with your mom when she's back to give birth. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah she, at the Paramount Theater. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, and, and then went to Seton Hospital. Uh -huh. What movie was she watch? What movie? <laughs> okay. I, I don't I've know. always heard it was Mildred Pierce, but I think that's a fiction. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Well, that could be. Maybe, maybe that's why I like Mildred Pierce <laughs> and, and uh, Michael Tur Curtis films. So. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I had a dysfunctional family, large family. And uh, my dad was in the hotel business. And he had a um, catty corner from what used to be called the Stephen F. Austin Hotel. There's still this little stone building. That, there was a hotel, and, and it was his hotel. And, and um, across the theater from the street from that was a theater, I think called the, the Queen Theater, something like that. And then down the block past the other way past Woolworth, there was another movie theater. And then I had, there was the State and the Paramount. And so, so he was a local businessman, and, um, and my babysitter was with the movie theaters. 
and and, and so I, you know I, I learned cinema and cartoons and stuff like that uh, as I was learning to speak, and um, so so that's part of it. I mean, so he would just park you in the yeah, yeah. And, but you know he loved movies as well, and um, and and movies were, didn't always come out the same. You know, didn't come to Austin the same year they were released. Mm -hmm. uh, the distribution patterns back then, uh, and um, but but uh, that's uh, that's all I really wanted to do ever. Um, I, I, I I was when about night twenty something like that, an usher at the Paramount Theater, but I was incompetent and <laughs> was fired, and and, uh, and and I'm happy I was, <laughs> and so so we started making. TV commercials here in town, mm -hmm. and and documentaries, and I was you know lucky enough to get documentaries that were um, left over from the Kennedy administration about um, um, progressive education, and and did, did a film with Peter Paul and Mary for oh you worked on Peter Paul and Mary yeah I directed which was uh, that was uh, what was his name. Fred Miller. Fred Miller. Yeah. Fred Miller. Yeah. So, I don't know, that's some of Now, you had even, but you had started making movies when you were just a child, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, so, I, tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> well, uh, you know, you know the, the, the same old eight millimeter uh, uh, story that you probably heard about from four or five directors. <laughs> you know, we, we got the parents' camera and started making little films. And you know, I still have most of them. Oh, you you have them? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. I I I if I have black and white eight millimeter of my first birthday party. <laughs> but it's just kind of you know, it's got to be kind of messy by now. But that's okay. You know. But you made some, and when you were a child, you made some horror films. Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, I made. Um, uh, uh, pit in the Pendulum <laughs> and 8 millimeter. I didn't finish them. That, 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 that was the hardest part of, uh, for me in, in making movies uh, as, a, as a kid. I, I didn't follow through and finish the film. My interest would go someplace else. And, and um, there, there, there was a time my, my producer you know, a film would cost like five dollars, five dollar budget. <laughs> and, and, uh, Get back to that. And, and my, my producer got, got in trouble. I mean, he, he was the one that would go to the drugstore and steal the, the <laughs> roll of eight millimeter film. And, and um, that's why he was the producer. <laughs> you know, right. We know that. <laughs> and so, um, so yeah, so I so I did nothing but but film or go see films. I, um, and Austin, um, living here, I saw a film, at least one film a day, if not two. And this is from when you were very young. Yeah, very young. And, you know, it was my, what I cared about. So in your 20s, you got into making documentary films and commercials? Yep. And well, what about the film you did with Farrah, Fa this commercial with Farrah? Fa oh, yeah, with, with, with Farrah, you know, for, for makeup. So it's not some makeup company, uh -huh. and and I think I did two or three of them uh, with Farrah, and um, and we were going to make a short subject, and uh, this this, uh, this 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 guy had, um, that I knew had a, somehow gotten a grant from um, the American Film Institute. And, and 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 he showed me, you know, he got ten thousand dollars and it was in variety, but he'd made that damn thing, you know, he'd made the ad and had a print of it, and so it was all <laughs> it's a lie. A phony ad. Yeah. And he showed it to you to convince yeah. you had the money. And he showed it to Farrell. That's also what a producer does. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and and so he skipped town, and he went to went to L.A. and I had a um, a charge account at Burns and Sawyer's. Uh, that you, that's, you know sells uh, motion picture equipment and rents it, and and uh, and he said that he was me, and he charged the splicer, and and he also stole a, a, a print of that Down Friday Street that documentary. 
oh, that you had done. And he re-edited it <laughs> and, and, and uh, put his name on it. And is this man a successful homemaker today? No. <laughs> no. So, and so, there's the HRC has a copy of a, an outtake from one of the Farrah Fawcett where she's walking down the street and a guy comes by on his bike and he sees her and he's so taken with her he ran, runs into a wall. It, yeah, he goes through a plate glass window. He goes through a plate glass window. Yeah. Window. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and one of your early special events. That, that was at the old uh, Mueller Airport. They went through, right through one of the damn uh, uh, glass walls. <laughs> but thank God he didn't get, you know, hurt. It's preserved on film. Yeah. So you're, you're making documentaries and industrials and commercials. Yeah. And how do you decide to make a feature? Oh, that's all I ever wanted to do. Uh -huh. I mean, that, that was just all a way of getting my hands on film, learning how to do it. Uh, you know, editing, makeup, uh, music, so sound cutting, uh, 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 photographing, uh, being my, my own DP. Um, and um, so, yeah, I, mean, I, 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 did, I did about 25 or 30 films for, for insurance companies. <laughs> they were taken around and shown on a Fairchild projector. <laughs> that, well, when they used to knock on the door to, you know, let me sell you this insurance policy. And, Plug the machine, and it was always about what happens. You know, if if uh, uh, the nightmare. If you yeah, one one of the titles was T Timothy doesn't live here anymore. You still have that? No, I don't. <laughs> anyway, so these were films you made for insurance people take around. So it was like disasters. Oh, oh, oh it's always. Uh, the husband would die, the wife would invariably become a prostitute. <laughs> so a, a lot of your generic call marks early on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so how, how much was the, the this film cost? Uh, this film? Yeah, eggshells. I, I think it, it cost around $40,000. And, and uh, probably including the blow up. Uh -huh. um, and and the blow up was done at uh, so you shot in sixteen shot in sixteen and blew it up to thirty five in in, in 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 Pittsburgh at, at uh, the the lab uh, Romero oh the church Romero yeah. w, WRS or something so did you meet Romero no not not back then <laughs> no no but they were mixing a film of his when, when I was up there mixing George Romero did Night of the Living Dead and. He was based out of Pittsburgh and did the same thing that Toby did, which was he did a lot of industrials and commercials and eventually on weekend shot Night of the Living Dead. So you used the same lab? I didn't know that. That's yeah, same lab. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, are there any questions from the audience? I'll open it up. Yes, over there. Yeah, I was curious about how you work with actors. I was, as you mentioned, this is made prior to Chainsaw, and I was reminded watching it look like improvisation or just very naturalistic conversations that, that they were having and how you directed that and then how has that changed when you moved into more mainstream films like Poltergeist and Salem's Lot where, you know, hit your mark and say you're lying. Talk about you, how you work with that. Well, well, it was, I think because of, of all the documentaries that I made uh, and, and Say so jump, jump cut to chainsaw. I, I, I wanted the behavior to be documentary like, which means uh, really uh, uh, minimalist uh, acting. Uh, but but the, but I, I shoot it over and over and over again. Um, kind of the Kubrick uh, way of, of saying it starts getting good around take sixty. <laughs> and, and, and you know, Stanley would shoot a hundred takes, and and it kind of break breaks the thing down, and um, and instead of uh, you know and, and encouraging the actor, letting the actor feel safe, uh, but making sure the that the actor is coming from from a subtext, you know, and and, and a backstory. And, and, and sometimes the backstory was real. I mean, I'd use anything I could. 
and um, um, I, it, that, that's become my most my favorite part of uh, working at Selma since visually finally turned into kind of a, a second language <coughs> for me. Um, but it's 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 working with the actors and uh, make, making them comfortable enough to uh, not act. But, but to behave. <laughs> and that's part of the, that's part of the, the answer. So, since you brought up Stanley Cooper, David uh, Hollander just told me a story about you and Stanley Cooper. Can you tell this story about when you met Stanley Cooper? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I met, yeah, I met Stanley, I was in London, and, um, and um, at EMI Elstree, and, and, and I heard, heard that uh, Stanley was mixing a film in uh, and, and the uh, and then the dubbing stage, and and so I, I I walked in and looked on the screen and it was The Shining, and um, and um, a couple of guys escorted me out early, early, early <laughs> like, way fast, and then I, and then I said you know I you know if you could uh, you know tell Mr. Kubrick that it's, you know Toby Hooper, I, I I had no idea if he knew who the hell that was. Uh, but he, um, he he rushed out and embraced me, and 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 he had bought a thirty a thirty five millimeter print of Chainsaw, and, and, and so had Ridley Scott and a lot of directors had, uh, that that were making horror films. Uh, the 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 interesting part of this story, though, is that The Shining had come out and played out two years prior to that <laughs> moment. And, and Stanley was still mixing the film. <laughs> and he, he, by God, was going to get it right. <laughs> and, and he was way cool. A, lo a lot, a lot like um, uh, in, in Lolita, Peter Sellers was doing a character, uh, uh, the, the, the character that comes in on James Mason. Uh, on the, the veranda of the hotel late at night and, and he says, uh, Peter Seller says he's a cop and with the cops convention and that, 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 and that had this kind of stutter that, that, that uh, my, my good, good friend George Swine, the night man can help you and this, that beautiful, lovely little girl uh, but, but he was imitating Stanley. And, uh, it's kind of, kind of like, you know, very interesting, David. Very interesting, man. Yeah, there are other questions. Yes. Yeah, hi. Um, I know as an artist um, that, that, that each, each piece of work you do as an artist, and you, you, when, you, when you start your next project, you will inadvertently some, some, sometimes carry something that you did in a previous project. Um, Maybe you you carry that little bit from your previous project in, intentionally or by accident. Maybe you take that that piece that you thought was good and you want to make it better, or 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 something you did in a previous project uh, wasn't all that great and you wanted to to try to retackle it or whatever. And 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 so my question is, as an artist, uh, what did you do in and in, in eggshells that was unique to anything you had done before that. And also, what did you carry from eggshells to the rest of your work uh, that, 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 that you carried over through in your, in, your, in your future films that was born inside of eggshells? The, the question is that as, as an artist, you frequently carry over from one project to the next project. Sometimes you have unresolved issues, sometimes you aren't trying to do something better, sometimes you've learned how to do something. What was unique to Eggshells and what did he learn during Eggshells that he took to his other projects? Well, th this is a, um, yeah, it's a complicated question uh, with, 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 with me. Uh, I, I, I'll work backward too, if you, if you don't mind. I try. I really try to throw it all away now, when, when I do something new, and um, uh, try not to crystallize on any, any one thing. But 
in the beginning, I think I was uh, uh, using technical style and, and finding uh, 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 like fine tuning, you know, my cinematic uh, voice or way of telling a story. Or, or, or as uh, Brian De Palma <laughs> would, would say, film grammar. Um, and, and, and just the cinematic work. And I, I, um, I, I hate like, you know, wide shot over the shoulder, over the shoulder, although I've done that. And sometimes you have to do that uh, to, to make sure you're covered, and, you know, and you, you can uh, create uh, good performances. Uh, but, but, one, but, you know, one, one of the things I, you know, intended to do, I mean, I, I, I came to this uh, and, and this style through watching um, a lot of experimental films uh, and, uh, and just wanted to do something new and, you know, uh, technically, like, like with the abstract uh, uh, sequences of uh, the sword fighting and things like that. Um, but I try to, you know, I, I, I take, I don't try to improve on something that didn't work in the first place. I try something new. Um, but, but I just don't want to be one of those guys that, that, um, well, in a way I do because you, you, you can't help but do that, as you know. Uh, uh, you know, the Hitchcock films, you know, I, I could look at a Hitchcock film without a credit and, <laughs> to, you know, tell you that he did it because of, of his visual style. Um, now, I, from this, what I took to Chainsaw, uh, the, the biggest thing was uh, and as an artist, too, I'll have to say, because this will sound very uh, uh, more business-like, uh, but, but th that was exactly it. I, I wanted to make a film that would be seen by enough people to get another job. And, <laughs> and so I, you know, I chose a genre that, 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 uh, that I didn't need stars. I, didn't need, I, j I just needed to be able to tell the story. And, uh, and so I learned a lot from this. And, and, and from uh, uh, local news in San Antonio, Texas, at the time, it was just ter terribly uh, horrible. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it was awesome, man. And, and, and they were selling beer, too. <laughs> I don't know if I'm satisfied that question. Yeah. But. Thank you very much. Over there. Uh, were those uh, cast members fellow students? And uh, I don't know, what, it, what, what did you ask them to be in it? And uh, do you even keep in touch with any of them anymore? Uh, the question is, were the cast members fellow students? Um, did he ask them to be in it? And does he keep in touch with any of them anymore? They, 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 they were students, and uh, I don't uh, keep in touch with. I haven't. I've been away. They've gone. They, they, they have a life, and I have a life, and uh, a kind of on the road kind of life. Uh, so it's so I don't. I, I, the the paths have not crossed uh, since then. Uh, and coincidentally, uh, Sharon Danzinger, who is in the couple, the couple with Alan Danzinger, who's wearing kind of the, the vest and they have the baby. Uh, when I, I moved, when I first came to Austin, the person who I was visiting was Sharon. And I actually, I do keep in touch and just got an email from her the other day inviting her to the screening, but I don't think she came. But um, Alan ran Three Ring Circus in Austin for a long time. And is also in Chainsaw, yeah. um, and and just oh. a, one of those coincidences. <laughs> oh, I, well, no, no I'm, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. <laughs> no, no, I mean Alan. Uh, yeah, Alan was such a natural. Yeah, I mean he was just such a such a natural. Uh, uh, Alan drives the van in Chainsaw. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, and and uh, you, you know, and you can't see the seams, and, and you know, there's some backstory there. I mean, like Franklin and Sally, and you know, they're they're all coming from someplace. But but Alan, I, I just had to work with Alan again. Other questions? Yes. How were those chickens so nonplussed by that explosion? <laughs> <laughs> the question is, how were the chickens? So nonplussed by the exploding car, and, and actually we have some stills, <laughs> but I don't think we have the. We'll put the car on, so we should take it. We know she have an attractive backdrop. They hadn't eaten in, in five or six days. <laughs> <laughs> and there was corn. But on the ground. Then they were fed very well. No chickens hurt in that. <laughs> yes. but, but I mean, that was, I mean the, the, that was something I had to, you know, figure out how, how to do. It, it would work both ways. I mean, the chickens jump straight up in the air, but you know, just... <laughs> so I'm going to give a, 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 a plug really quick. These are not stills that you're about to show. Okay. They are beautiful Kodachrome slides at the HRC that um, if you email me, my name is Hallie, you can meet me outside, or Steve Wilson at the HRC, we have Toby's collection, and it is not live online yet, but you're more than welcome to email me, and I can see if you guys can get in and look at the really cool stuff there. It's Hallie from the uh, HRC saying that the whole eggshells collection is at the HRC, and these are um, prints of um from from that collection and it's not online yet but it will be how you can make that look better right yeah i mean you can, yeah i mean just, just, just like all the restoration yeah it's amazing yes over here hi what has changed most in terms of what you're passionate about in filmmaking then in the beginning as opposed to now uh, the question is, what has changed most about what uh, Toby's passion about in filmmaking uh, then and now? Oh, God. Uh, no, man. Uh, well, I, 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 I when, when I was like, uh, four or five years old, again, when I was like 10 or 11 or something, I experienced a couple of uh, moments in a movie theater uh, that, uh, that was probably one of the reasons I, I, I went into this, and, and that was I, at a certain moment, two or three seconds, I, I would kind of go out of body, I, I would kind of merge with, with what was happening, um, kind, of, kind of a emotional thing. I mean, I was no longer there. I was totally involved, and and um, and, um, and and then I saw that happen in the seventies and the, uh, or the or the late sixties. A couple of times, I would go out. Kind of, I call it going out of body, but but but, but it, it really isn't that. I'm not I'm not floating out here looking at myself. <laughs> I mean, I'm t talking about becoming really. Uh, engaged with, with what I'm watching to the point that I for, I'm forgetting about myself and, and my voice is stopped. And, uh, and so uh, I wanted to see how long someone could do that. Uh, you, you know, how, how long someone could maintain that kind of uh, uh, magic that is, you know, re really just involvement. Uh, and so I, um, uh, you know, over over many years, I mean, I've, I've, I found that if if cinema goes into the aperture that um, that we use to perceive music, and um, and and the whole thing, it becomes m more than cinema, but some kind of musical um, experience. Uh, that that we're most likely to float or to drift away. And, and so, I mean, that's my passion, is to sustain that moment of involvement as long as possible. 
Um, uh, did that question have two parts? <laughs> or was that if it? it? If, it, if that just stayed the whole time and through your whole career, then that would answer it. Mm -hmm. oh, I beg your pardon, sorry. The, the question, yes, that answers my question, but it was, has that changed? Has that evolved for you? From the beginning to the end, or is that just Oh, I've, I've been able to s sustain that moment longer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, where? Over here? Back There's corners. two people back there. What? <laughs> okay, perfect. Right. Yes. Yes. I was just wondering if you could describe, it, like, in your words, what was happening in that last scene with the driver? Question is asking Toby in his own words describe what's happening in the last scene. There, there, there was on on um, oh, um, what is the drag? It used to be called the drag. The but, drag. Yes. Uh, but, but it turns into it. it and and then it goes by the state hospital. Yeah. All right. Well, before you get to the state hospital, there used to be on uh, uh, a, a, a junk shop, kind of pawn, pawn shop or junk shop, and and that hair dryer had been sitting out there for about seven years, <laughs> and, and and no one had bought it. And, and, and I loved that damn thing. <laughs> and um, you, you know, and I it. Uh, I mean it. I, I mean, what it says is, you know, I mean, the, the, you know, these hippies got, got down. I mean, they, they got pure. <laughs> and I mean, they, they found a way to integrate in, 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 into nature. <laughs> and and I, symbolically, you know, or literally, you know. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, that's, that's what that was about. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'd like to ask a follow-up question uh, to two questions ago. Um, could you talk about what movies trans uh, took you out of your body? Do you remember what movies uh, they were, what directors? You know, back also when you're a kid, but now, you know, what directors working give you that experience? Oh, the, the question was, uh, what movies really took Toby out of his body and what directors were? Well, um, the first time that happened, um, I, and I'm not sure if it was a Manelli film or not, it was a dreadful movie. And it, it was a, and I think it was called Goodbye Charlie. And it was about uh, Tony Curtis dying and becoming a cat or something. <laughs> His spirit goes into it, a cat. And, um, um, and maybe even Debbie Reynolds may have popped her head in there, I'm not sure. But, but the moment was the music. Um, it, it was a good composer, and the, the, the moment of information, of, of, of learning what this film is about, was at just the right moment. And the camera starts moving uh, toward a... Uh, Doorways that opened up to uh, to a, uh, uh, a a deck that overlooks the Pacific Ocean, and um, I don't know why. You know, I, I have no idea why. I mean, it was a, it was a terrible movie, um, but but it may have been in that way. So, and what was it? Yeah. Oh, cool. Oh, good. good. Memory memories working. Yeah, yeah. Fondly, no. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I don't remember the movie fondly. I remember that, that, that couple of seconds. And, 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 and I'm not sure, I mean, Lawrence of Arabia had moments like that. They held a Dr. Zhivago. Um, uh, and Zhivago was, uh, yeah, it was very arresting. I mean, there, there's so many Tanyas or, uh, that came out of that period. I mean, there's so many... Uh, you know, Russian names, uh, yes. uh, uh, um, students uh, naming their children, but that, that, you know, that revolutionary, you know, good, 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 good stuff. Anyway, David Lean's one, one of my favorite yeah. directors. Uh, I, I was just curious about the locations, the house, first of all, because that's such a 
the, the key location in the movie. Do you remember where the house was, and is it still around? Yeah. Yes. So, well, I don't know. It's on it was on F Avenue or F Street, uh, by in Hyde Park, uh, and it it. Uh, and we rented the house, uh, or stripped it, or I, and then painted it, or it was painted that way already, I'm not sure. But well, that actually kind of leads to a follow-up question. I was kind of wondering, were you counterculturally yourself at the time? Oh, yes, I, yes, I, I, I The question is just totally counterculturally. Yeah, so. oh, yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> Hippies and, I, I, you know, I mean, you, you know, yeah, yes, I mean, you know, sandals and, uh, <laughs> Long hair and uh, you know the you know the whole nine yards. Um, the 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 actors wanted me to to participate in the nudity, <laughs> and, and you know and I, and I really had to think about that. You know, is that that you know there could be an accident, you know, <laughs> uh, 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 to a terrible accident for me. Uh, there. It could distract me from what I'm doing, and, and so I, you know, I, I got, you know, I, I got pretty, pretty straight about that and said no. Yeah. How, how long did you shoot for? About I, probably six or nine months or something. So you shot on and off weekends. Yeah, yeah. When, when you had time. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any other questions? So, so uh, oh, me? Oh. I was going to ask you about, can you tell us about the premiere of the film and the actors and the crew's reaction to the nine months they had spent? What was that like and where was the premiere? It's the question is about the premiere of the film, uh, what it was like, the actors, and what the reaction was. I don't. I, I don't know what the. Uh, I don't. I, I don't know what the actors' reaction. There, there was no like premiere. It, <laughs> it, 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 it showed it. Uh, it was show, uh, sh uh, on the drag. There's the, uh, the the Varsity Theater, and then and then the, the Texas, and it was showing at the Texas, and uh, and then um, uh, uh, the Bogdanovich movie, uh, you know, the, the, the last, picture last, picture show, right? the last picture show was showing at the Varsity, <laughs> and so so the, uh, the the Texas Theater was. Uh, it, it was hard to see the image for the smoke, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that was part of the review, too. <laughs> and the Austin, Austin Statesman. Yes. And it made it, you know, and, and um, yeah, yeah, it was very smoky. And, <laughs> it later became a porn theater, appropriately. Is that, is that right? <laughs> the long life is a porn theater. <laughs> I, I was just trying to keep the whole thing going. Uh, so uh, you had a long career. You made a lot of movies. You worked with a lot of actors. Who are some of the better, uh, you, some of your favorite actors to work with, and some of your least favorite actors? To work with? <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> oh, uh, well. Um, uh, mm. <laughs> what, 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 one of the harder actors I worked with was this old actor, Lou Ayers, who, who told me to get in this goddamn costume and do it myself. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, uh, but there was a lesson in that. Uh, and and, and I, I don't know, I, uh, Louis Fletcher is, a, is just you know, really cool. I don't know, Dennis Hopper. Uh, um, I don't know, man. There's been a lot of them that are that are good, and not and not 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 too many bad eggs. Not too many cracks. So, how long after eggshells did you do chainsaw? Uh, let's see. It was a uh, about uh, two two years. Is Wayne Bell back there? Yeah, I'm here. How long, man, do you think? Uh, we shot eggshells in spring and summer of 70, and we shot uh, Chainsaw in summer of 73? Yeah, I think it was, yeah. And how long a shoot was Chainsaw? 
what, uh, like six weeks, was it? Yeah, entirely in the hottest, absolute part of the hottest summer. <laughs> yeah, there were stories from the set, from the actors who were stuck inside that house for 20 hours or 24 hours with Bob Burns' art. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, Bob's art, yeah. The, there was very slow speed film, so the, the, the lights were very hot. And, uh, and 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 that stuff was still cooking. I mean, I mean, the, all the skeletons were real, <laughs> and uh, the chicken head on the table, which was not the chicken in the bird cage, that had been transformed into the that was another chicken, um, and um, um, it, it was cooking, and and it was very hot, and we we shot a twenty-seven hour day, and it was. So we're shooting um, like the already 110 out, outdoors, and we're shooting night for uh, 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 night for day, which meant we tinted the house black in and, and, and the daytime, and that turned it into must have been 117 degrees, and 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 smoke, you know, was the the human skeleton uh, totem had um, lights inside it, and it was smoldering and, and it was, <laughs> anyway Dramamine had to, I mean a doctor had to come out of me and say cut when I said cut uh, because I would just roll on and on and say do it again, do it again and, uh, and you know and, and, until people were nuts and uh, and uh, and then the, I'd say cut and they would dash to the windows and puke <laughs> and uh, uh, dr the Dramamine helped. <laughs> I, had to, I had to get that page shot. And um, so, how long after you finish Chainsaw uh, it gets released? <coughs> at what point does it become a hit? And what kind of surprise was that? Oh, no, that was a. That, was a, that, was a, a that, that became the hit that it did was a big surprise. I, 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 I knew that it was so different that it was going to be spe very special. <laughs> and uh, and and I knew you know I was uh, you know re reaching I mean you get, getting high up there in my game level and and and, and both uh, you know vision visual and performances and 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 the, and the science of setting things up uh, and um, but it was a, I don't know it was a matter of um, a couple of months. And, and and then and then it uh, and 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 Rex Rex Reed uh, uh, went to see it on Forty Second Street. We talked about this. No, no, yeah, actually. And, 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 and he, he, went, he went with two friends, and, and she was pregnant. Uh, during the wife, and and she has she she puked and <laughs> and. Uh, and, and, and there, there were like fist fights broke out in San Francisco because the city council went to see taking a Pelham 123 because the, the, their underground had just compl been completed. And, and uh, Chainsaw pops on the screen as a sneak preview. And, and then there's, some, there's more puking and now there's fist fighting and stuff. And, and then, uh, well anyway, Rex Reed, I, uh, uh, gave it a great review, and then the, the Museum of Modern Art took a look at it and 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 uh, bought it for the permanent collection, and then it uh, was um, uh, chosen by the Cannes Film Festival for the uh, Kinsane, the director's fortnight, uh, and and was a big hit, and. Uh, and, and it's the only film that uh, has been selected for the, the King Zane and the history of the Cannes Film Festival twice. It, it was in, in, in the King Zane and shown at the Palais uh, several weeks ago or six weeks ago, whatever. Uh, but, but anyway, it, 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 it was pretty, pretty, went pretty fast. It's, it seemed kind of long, but, uh, but it, was, it was faster than I, you know, uh, as things are. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the time between Eggshells and Chainsaw and your development in that time and how you went from this to that? And 
what your the, progress was. Yeah, the question is is about uh, the time between uh, eggshells and chainsaw, and uh, about Toby's development as a filmmaker between eggshells and chainsaw. Well, I went to a lot of movies, uh, and I don't know. Wait, do you have any idea? <laughs> uh, nothing I would be able to say publicly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I was. Uh, I knew I had to make another film. I, I knew it had. I knew I had to get attention, and I, I knew that, that, that there was there was not a connection between Los Angeles and, and the in the film industry and and Austin. Uh, but uh, w with the exception of Warren Scarron, uh, who, who uh, well, no, no, actually, no, that was just before Chainsaw. Yeah. Somewhere just before Chainsaw, uh, Warren Scarron developed the Texas Film Commission, and and he was, uh, v you know, very important in uh, in my life and in, 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 in Chainsaw. Warren died. Uh, Warren wrote a, was the president of student body at Rice and wrote a letter to Preston Smith, who was the governor of Texas, uh, on why there should be a Texas Film Commission. And Preston Smith got in touch with Warren and said, yes, his letters persuaded me that we need a Texas Film Commission, and you should be the Texas Film Commissioner. So Warren started the Texas Film Commission. He then started an equipment house in Dallas, but he died very young, tragically, from a melanoma. But he went to, he became a script doctor before he died. And he only worked on five films, again, before he died tragically young. But the f four of the five films were um, Beverly Hills Cop 2, Top Gun, uh, Beetlejuice, and Batman, where he was the final script writer on all of those films when they were shooting. And, and Warren also brilliantly named... The, uh, uh, found the title. Uh, uh, the original title, uh, uh, and, and was a working title, it was was Head Cheese. <laughs> and, and, and One suspects the title change helped. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and so, but you know, we, we knew we were looking for, for a title, and then Warren called me and said, uh, uh, and said uh, uh, the title, and I thought about it. And, I, and I'm thinking like an artist, you know, like like arti very artistically, and thinking, well, that I am. <laughs> and um, and I didn't know until uh, uh, Wayne uh, told me that uh, he t uh, I told Wayne the title, and and Wayne, uh, I don't know if you remember this man, but you you um, you you told the title to your girlfriend. <laughs> Wayne she, Bell is here, the and, sound and, man, and, and so many of these films. And you said that she said many films. that if it was called that, that she wouldn't go see it. <laughs> <laughs> and I decided, well, that's 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 got to be the title. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's to you. I mean, Wayne, that's a tribute. <laughs> and, the Warren Scarron collection is at the HRC, and there's actually a piece so of cool. paper. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a piece of paper where you can see he was playing with the title, and you can actually see him come up with, you know, crossing out words. This Texas Chainsaw Massacre is pretty. Uh, let me take one more question, and over there, yes. I just wanted to know about the balloons and eggshells. How long? <laughs> how long do they take to pump up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the question is about the balloons and eggshells. <laughs> I mean, that was, a t you know, talking about being a, a uh, you know, someone who likes tedious stuff. <laughs> it, it would take, I don't know how many weeks that, that took, actually, because, you know, the day would start with uh, inflating the balloons and then pinning them down. And then uh, that was that was shot. There used to be a, a little jungle kind of area behind uh, Laguna Gloria, is that, is that still? Yeah, yes, yeah, still there. And, and um, oh, it was, it was very, you know, it was tedious, took a hell of a long time, and, uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, a couple of people, crew, uh, and, um, yeah, what was your question? How long did it take? <laughs> it took a long time. <laughs> right, well, I think we all want to thank Toby very much. Thank you very much.
Thank you.